ones that I've looked at so far have all all been about mentorship or something similar, but they've all been about somebody basically who was a master and somebody who was following and learning their skill. And as and as I looked at this this morning, I I um I almost wish that I could have taught it to the youth. Y'all sure are scattered out this morning. Oh, it's God. I've got one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people in there everywhere but in front of me. Hey, it's God. Don't y'all want to move to the front this morning so I can see y'all? Praise the Lord. Brother, Sister Pittman, would you, wouldn't y'all like to move to the front? I'd appreciate it. Hey, it's God, brother. Uh, if nothing else, if y'all can't move right here, move all over here so I can talk over here. Hey, it's God. Hallelujah. Thank you. I appreciate it. It just seems a little better that way. Thank you. Amen. I got to pick on somebody this morning. But as, as I saw this, there was a lot for the youth, and then I realized there's a lot for me and the, the older folks among us, the, the younger older folks among us. Praise God. Nobody's real old in here this morning. Brother Randy. Amen. But as I looked at this, um, the, the message today is the prophet and the plowboy, and it's about Elijah and Elisha. And it is that message that we know so well how Elijah passed his mantle to Elisha. And I'm going to just endeavor to share with you a few thoughts on that this morning. Amen. Um, the focus thought is God has given us the gift of life and it is a wonderful experience. In Jesus Christ, we learn to appreciate life's challenges, purpose, and potential. Amen. In the focus verse this morning, 2 Kings 2 and 9, and it came to pass that when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Amen. A double portion. How many times have we prayed that, Lord, I want a double portion of your spirit? I don't know if you have, but I have in the past and not really quite understanding what that meant, but especially as a young person, I would pray that and just, and have no concept what I was praying for. But let's just ask the Lord one more time to speak to us. God, I ask you, Lord, this morning to break open the words of life and let it not just be a Sunday school lesson, Lord, but challenge us with something that will help us this morning, even in Sunday school, to live for you, God, to see, Lord, your hand at work in everything in our lives. In Jesus' name. We live in a world where, as the lesson put it, people balk at having to climb the ladder of success. And a lot of times the problem with our young people is they want to start at the top. As we know that very well, don't we? They, they want to start where they can just, they, they want to start, graduate high school, and the next day be the boss. And we know that, that does, it doesn't work that way. And they could learn, but we could learn as well, from the prophet Elisha. His servant's heart and willingness to be a follower rather than a leader paved the way for him to receive a double portion of God's spirit. And when I think about Elisha, I always think about the mighty miracles. And he was known as the great miracle-working prophet. But before he could work miracles and before he could do the things for God that he did, he had to become a servant. And he had to find a place to serve the man of God. He began by answering the call of the prophet Elijah. And when he did, he left behind his plowboy status to become Elijah's apprentice. And um, I was actually thinking about this this morning the 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 concept of an apprentice is not something that we are used to anymore i remember reading about an apprentice but in days gone by before there were as many vocational schools as there are now somebody would take a young man sometimes a young lady but usually a young man under his wing 
and began to teach him a certain skill. And for two or three or sometimes four or five years, a young man would learn to, to do that craft or that trade, such as a, a blacksmith or whatever it was, and they would not be paid for that service. And they would not be recognized as um, a blacksmith or they were the apprentice. And the, the pay they got for running errands and hauling water and chopping wood and whatever it was that they did, cleaning the shop, mopping the floor, fetching tools, was that in time, that young man would learn the skill of the master of the master and what he would do when he learned the skill is one day he knew if I can stay through this apprenticeship I will be counted worthy to open my own business and someday it will be repaid to me because I'll be able to make money off of my skill but it was no question that he had to learn the skill first and sometimes in life we can get in a situation no matter how young, old, middle-aged, wherever we are, where it seems like we can wonder, God, have I not learned yet? <laughs> Why am I still in this apprenticeship stage? Anybody ever been there? And you just feel like you're spinning your wheels. But the thing is, all of us have to go through times and stages where God is molding us and making us. See, in the kingdom of God, there, there, there was a time when, when in the apprenticeship stage, the apprentice would graduate. But in the kingdom of God, the graduation is, amen, when we either breathe our last or we are raptured out of here. <laughs> because in this life, there's always something that God is fine-tuning in us. And I'm so thankful for that this morning. Amen. But looking at Elijah and Elisha, Elisha had an outstanding example in the prophet Elijah. Elijah was the, the, the mighty prophet that withstood Ahab and Jezebel. And we remember a few of the things that Elijah did. He was the, the prophet that called all the the prophets of Baal together and and he built an altar and he said you go first I'll let you call on your God and I'll call on my God and the God who sends fire down from heaven will let him be God and so he built the altar and he sat back and he watched them and from morning until noon and then from noon to afternoon it starts getting over toward the time of the evening sacrifice and Elijah gets a little bold and he begins to laugh and mock at the prophets of Baal. Where is your God? Is he asleep? Maybe he's on vacation. He's a God, isn't he? Well, and they got so frustrated and mad that they began to cut themselves as, as, the, as the pagans did in that day and pour their own blood out on this altar and, and cry out. And of course nothing happened because their God wasn't listening. But then Elijah gets up with the, the confidence that one can only have when you know that you know who God is. And he rebuilds this altar and then he calls for water to be poured on the altar. And he pours this water on the altar and he said that's not enough. And he called for more and he called for more and, and the water covered the altar and covered the sacrifice and ran down and they even dug a, a, a ditch around the altar and the water filled up the ditch around the altar and it and there was no way at that point that an ordinary fire could have lit that altar but at that moment Elijah prayed and he said basically God let it be known in all Israel once and for all that you are God and when he did fire came down from heaven just as it did when it first lit the fire in the tabernacle of Moses and it the Bible says it consumed the altar burn up the stones burnt the wood burnt consumed the sacrifice and licked up burn all the water out of the trenches and licked up the dust 
around the place where the altar was. And can you imagine the, 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 the excitement and the confidence and the boldness that Elijah had at that moment? But in the next moment, he was running for his life. <laughs> because he, he, he had called fire down from heaven, but it made this woman that, the, that you know we know so well, Jezebel, so mad and so angry that Jezebel sent a word to, well, I, I'm getting ahead of myself this morning, but, but Elijah gave a command that they grab all those false prophets he called together and that they take them down to the brook Kidron and kill them. Because the penalty under the law of Moses was that if somebody prayed to a God other than the Lord or somebody was involved in witchcraft, that they would be put to death. And he caught, pulled them all down to the brook and he killed several hundred of the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves. And when he did, Jezebel sent out a word saying, just like you killed all of them before the sun goes down, I'm going to kill you. And this mighty man of God who had just prayed and called fire down from heaven. If you can imagine it this morning, all of a sudden he is fearful for his life and he is running like a madman into the desert to get away from this wicked woman, scared to death. And he goes into the wilderness and the Bible says that he found a tree and he was so exhausted he just laid down and he requested for himself that he might die. He just laid there and he was just ready to die. And, and we know, if you've read the story, you know that an angel came and ministered to him and gave, cooked some bread and gave him some water and he ate that and he went 40 more days into the wilderness and he came to the Mount of God, Mount Horeb, Mount Carmel, uh, not Mount Carmel, but which is Mount Sinai. And he, and he went into the... Um, the cave there and the Lord came and talked to him and whispered to him and encouraged him and, and, and renewed his strength and the Lord spoke to him in this moment this mighty man of God who had called fire down from heaven and then who had ran from the pres from the presence of a wicked king and queen and he was hiding in a cave and the Lord reminded him and said I have 7,000 people in this nation who have not bowed their knee to Baal. They have not polluted the name of their God. They have not worshipped at a grove. They have not sacrificed their children to heathen gods. They have kept their love for the law of God. And if you will go back, I have a plan. And as I looked at this story this morning of Elijah and Elisha, what came to mind is, God always has a plan. <laughs> God always knows what he's doing. When we get in a situation where we're just scratching our heads and we're wondering what God is doing, it, and, and, and we can look at the, the world around us and we can see how wicked it looks and how evil it looks. And, and it seems like every day people are more and more uh, just, just purposely have set themselves to make a stand against all that is holy and godly. Uh, politicians and church leaders alike. And, and, and we can talk about that all day, but what I want to focus on this morning is that God always has a plan. Amen. And the Lord spoke to Elijah and he sent him back to anoint two kings. And he also said, I want you to go and find Elisha. You know Elisha, he's the son of Shaphat, and he is out there plowing in the fields. And he said, I want you to go by and anoint him to be the next prophet in Israel. And I can imagine maybe Elijah just kind of puzzled with that one. Because, we'll, we'll see it in a minute, there was... In those days, the Bible makes it very clear that there was a school of prophets. These were young men who were, 
whose fathers and mother, uh, m fathers had been prophets. Maybe their mothers have been prophetesses. We do find them in the Old Testament, by the way. And they were people who had a godly heritage and, and they had bound themselves together in what the Bible says was, or, or you know, in some translations, a school of the prophets. And, and basically we understand that they were there together where they were studying the law of Moses or what were not exactly clear, but basically we could compare it to a Bible school. And there were young men there that were probably well qualified to be called to take Elijah's place. But God did not send Elijah to the Bible school to pick his successor. God did not send Elijah to the school of the prophets to send his, pick his successor. But God sent Elijah to someone who was plowing a field. And the reason was because the next generation had to know how to serve. Had to know how to be a servant. Elisha, whether he was plowing his own fields for his father or whether he was working for somebody else, we, we really don't know. But we know that when Elijah passed by, he found Elisha hard at work. And can I tell you this morning, what, if you are desiring to be used of God and you're asking the Lord, Lord, what is it that I can do for your kingdom? If we would just simply find something to do, for God's kingdom that needs to be done and, and, and do it with all of our heart and do it well that, um, amen, the Lord knows. And, and I told you, I don't, I don't know why I'm struggling with this this morning because I felt like when I read this that the young men needed to hear it. But I'm giving it to you and maybe you can pass it on to your children. Praise God. But, but as, I could, as I saw this, there are... You know, are times when, when we feel like, amen, that we just want to do more for God. And we feel like, God, why am I not being used, or this or that, or whatever it is. And the point is that the lesson brought out that we have to learn how to be a servant. Elisha was known as the man who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Amen. Elijah, Elisha was known as the one who, perhaps if you allow me to use my imagination, he washed Elijah's clothes and he, and he fixed Elijah's meals. And, and, and all the things that he did for Elijah, basically Elisha was a servant. But Elisha somehow knew in his heart that if I will serve the mantle of of anointing of God that is on Elijah will fall to me. Amen. And, and perhaps I'm not talking to, to ministry this morning, but can I tell you this? If you will be faithful and love the man of God and pray for the woman of God and bless the house of God and do things for the kingdom of God, I promise you that when you have a need, God will meet it. Do you know that there's a principle in scripture that when we lift up the hands of the ministry and when we help and when we give to the kingdom of God, that God always gives back to us. And I promise, I, I, I know that everybody in this church is faithful and, and you give and, and, and all that. And what I'm saying this morning is, if you find yourself in a trial, this is not really in the notes, but I think it fits. If you find yourself in a, in a puzzling situation and you know that you have ministered around the house of God and you know you've been faithful to the, to the saints of God and you know that you've given when it was hard to give, you know what? God is obligated by his word to take care of your situation. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? That God knows how, amen, to give back to those that are willing to give for his kingdom. Amen. When we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha this morning, we see Elisha was in a humble situation. He 
was not, amen, starting at the top, if you will. It was truly a place of master and servant. And this day and age, especially in, in our culture, um, we don't really like the, the, the idea. I was working with somebody one time and um, somebody referred to us. I, we were, you know, I, I worked in housekeeping for a long time before the Lord promoted me. Praise God. And, um, and, and the Lord really did promote me. I, I, I went from, um, with, with no degree, I went from sweeping floors. And a year later, I was working in an office with people who had masters and doctorates. And can I tell you, the Lord promoted me. And, and this morning, if, and, and I'll just add that in. If you, it, whatever it is, if you need a better job or whatever, the Lord knows how to promote his people. I have seen it over and over again. When you are faithful to what God gives you to do, no matter what it is. <laughs> what, you know what? I, 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 would, I would push that broom and push the mop and, I, and I'd say, and I, I'm not patting myself because there's a lot of days I wish I probably was doing something else. But I'd push that broom and mop and say, Lord, I thank you that you gave me a job. And I know that when you get ready to move me, you're going to... And people would say, why are, you, why are you mopping floors? Why don't you go get a better job? Why don't you do... And I'd say, you know what? God gave me this job. I asked the Lord. Uh, I was in a situation where I needed a job, and I prayed, and I, and I had been offered a, a, a job with a lot better pay, but I had to drive over an hour to get there. And, um, and it was just... Um, it, it was just a not a good situation and it would have kept me away from church and I, I talked to a pastor at the time my pastor at the time and and he didn't really want me to take the job because he felt like it would keep me away from the house of God too much and I said Lord I need the job you want me and a lady in the church came to me that very week and said um, do you know anybody who wants to work in housekeeping at the college and I said yeah I do she said, well, it doesn't pay very much. I said, that's all right. It's a perfect job. It's Monday through Friday. I'll be off by 3 o'clock, and I can do things around the house of God. And, and, and she said, okay, I'll get you hired. Well, people would come, and they'd say, why are you pushing a mop, Ms. Jones? You have all these skills. Uh, you, you know, you have a lot more experience than this. You can do more than what you're doing. And I say, you know what? When God gets ready to move me, God's going to move me. And when God got ready to move me, God moved me and he moved me in a big way. And can I tell you, you, you may feel like what you're doing is not important because all of us find ourselves in places where we can feel like what we're doing, whether it be on our job or whether it be in the church or whatever it is that we're doing is not significant enough for the kingdom of God. But can I tell you today, if you're doing what you're doing faithfully and you're doing it prayerfully and you're doing it with all of your heart, you are where God wants you. And if God has a place for you that it is not what you're doing now, he knows how to pick you up and put you there. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that? Amen. When we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, the Bible tells us that there came a day when Elijah was going to be taken up. <laughs> one of the only men in the, one of the only two men in the Bible that was taken up into heaven without dying. The other was Enoch. And the Bible says he walked with God and he was not because God took him. And the writer of Jude expounds on that and said, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, was, did not see death, but the Lord took him. And so, for whatever reason, the Lord had decided beforehand. I know there's probably typology and all that, but sometimes they just leave things in the wisdom of God. But the Lord had decided he was going to take up Elijah into heaven and Elijah wasn't going to see death. And Elisha knew it 
how he knew. I guess because somewhere in washing Elisha's clothes and somewhere in carrying water and fixing Elijah's meals, Elisha began to hear the voice of God for himself. And there's something about that when you're busy about the kingdom of God and you're around people who love God and who know how to pray. It has a way of getting on you. And Elisha had begun to hear the voice of God and somehow he must have known something's about to happen. And there came a day when Elijah said, I need you to stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. I'm just going to Bethel to do an errand. God has sent me to do something. So just stay here. And he said, no. As the Lord lives, I will not leave you. And he went with him and they, they get to this place in Bethel and the Bible says the sons of the prophets, no doubt they, they had a spiritual experience because they heard from God. And they came out to Elijah or Elisha and they said, do you know that the Lord is going to take away your master from you today? Do you know that God's getting ready to take Elijah out of here? And he said, yeah, I know. Just shh, be quiet. Don't worry about it. God's got it. And they went on and Elijah turned around and he told Elisha, stay here in Bethel because the Lord has called me to Jericho. And he said, no, the Lord called me to be your servant. And as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. And he goes on with him to Jericho. When he gets to Jericho again, the, those that were in the Bible school, the sons of the prophets, came out again. Do you know that the Lord's going to take away your master from your head today? And he said, yeah, I know. Just leave it alone. Be quiet. And it happened three times that Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. And he said, no. I will not stay here. I'm going where you go. And as I read this and contemplated it in, in preparation for this lesson today, I thought, you know, there are sometimes when well-intentioned people will tell us what they think we need to do. And well-intentioned, and, 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 and I know it's quiet, I'm just talking to you from my heart this morning. Well-intentioned, godly, Holy Ghost-filled people will give us advice about what they think we need to do. And that vi advice is not what the Lord would have us to do. But Elijah, or Elisha, had said it in his mind. I will follow the man of God. Because see, when God gets ready to talk to us, he will always speak from our leadership down. Did you know that? If you're contemplating a decision this morning, whatever it is, if you get in, or if you ever get in a place where you're praying about something or you don't know what to do about something, I can tell you where the best place you can go, straight to the Lord in prayer, and the next place you need to go is to your pastor and say, do you have something that you would like to give me? Do you have something you'd like to tell me? Do you have some words of wisdom? You know what? We will save ourselves. A, and pastor's not here this morning, so I can just, I can say this. I mean, I'm not patting anybody on the back, but I love my pastor. And I, and I, you know, I can't think of a better thing on Father's Day than to say, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that we have a man of God who loves us and treats us all like his children and, and prays for us and is kind to us. And, and, and he just, you know what, it's so awesome to be under the shelter of a man of God who hears from God, who loves God, and who will tell us what the Lord says. And if he doesn't know, he'll say, you know what, I'll pray about it. We'll pray about it. But there are well-intentioned people. Everybody in the world's got advice about what we need to do. But when we set ourselves to follow after the things of God, there is no safer place than to be in the house of God under an anointed man of God who will tell us what does saith the Lord according to the word of God. 
Amen. It's easy to prophesy and it's easy to be spiritual. Amen. I, I don't know where that came from this morning, but just it kind of, you know, just was ringing in my mind as I was studying this lesson that people can give us advice, but it may not be what the Lord would say. And Elisha said, no, I appreciate your advice. Obviously, you've heard from the Lord because you know something's going to happen. But the Lord's already talked to me. And I am following after the man of God who came by and laid his cloak on me and, and, and passed an anointing to me. And I'm going to have everything that the Lord wants for me. Elisha was faithful and he was committed. He left plowing fields and he didn't immediately perform miracles and he didn't immediately hear from the Lord, but he left plowing fields to wash Elijah's clothes and carry his bags. But he never disdained the calling and he never, we never find in scripture that he said, why am I still here pouring water on the hands of Elijah? But he respected the man of God and he understood the wisdom of Proverbs 27, 18. Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. And he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Amen. He did not seek wealth or prestige. One day, the lesson brought this out. Elisha himself would have a servant named Gehazi whose self-centeredness led to his ruin. And if you remember the story of Gehazi, uh, it was when Naaman the prophet came. And the pastor talked about that just a uh, uh, Sunday or two ago, or maybe a Wednesday or two ago. That Naaman the prophet came and he, he wanted Elijah to wave his hand over him and call on God and deliver him from his leprosy. And he, Elijah, I don't know if he recognized it or if he just did what the Lord said, but... He said, no, I think this man needs a lesson in humility. <laughs> and he sent him down to dip in the Jordan River seven times. And then Naaman comes back to Elijah with all these gifts. And Elijah said, I don't want none of that. All the glory goes to God. And, or Elisha rather. And Gehazi, amen, Gehazi sees that. And he runs after Naaman and basically says, my master changed his mind. Two young men came from the, from the Bible school, if you will, and they need a change of clothes. And if you could send me some silver and, and something back to bless them. It's not for us, it's for them. And he carries it back and he hid it. And he went back in the house and, and Elisha looks at this and he said, is it a time for you to receive houses and land and silver and gold? We are about the master's business. And he said, let the leprosy that was on Naaman be on you and all your descendants. And Gehazi left from the presence of Elisha and he was covered in leprosy. And as I read this, it made me wonder, or just see the contrast between Elisha and Gehazi. Because Elisha had followed Elijah until the mantle came to him. And it makes me realize that Gehazi was supposed to follow Elisha until the mantle came to him. But instead, he went in search of riches. And how many ministries have we seen? And how many people have we seen that no matter how great they started out, and no matter how powerful they started out, they somehow lost it in the pursuit of fame and fortune and money. And, and, and you know what? We need to be careful of, 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 of what the world pushes, amen, as things of God. And, and all they are about is money. And, and I could get on my soapbox this morning, and that's not what the lesson is about. But, but I'll say it. I, 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 um, nothing makes me just just plain out mad like seeing somebody get up with a little bottle and say I prayed over this little bottle of oil and if you'll send me a check today I'll send you this bottle of oil in the mail and you put it on whatever and anoint your pocketbook and and you know what we can't say all the things of God come on it's not mine and it's not yours to sell 
And God blesses us all for our faithfulness to his kingdom and because he loves us. And, and if somebody tells you you got to pay something to get a blessing from God, you can just throw that out the window because I can't buy it. Simon the sorcerer couldn't buy it from the apostle Peter. And, and, and I told you I could get on my soapbox this morning. You can't buy the things of God. And I'm not talking about being good enough to buy the things of God this morning. God gives us what he gives us because he loves us. Amen. Praise God. That was good. I'll pat myself on the back, as Pastor likes to say. Praise God. Let me tell you, you can't, you can't buy the things of God. But one thing you can do is fall in love with Jesus and teach your children that if we fall in love with Jesus and if we're faithful to him and, and, and if we will do the menial task and if we will give ourselves to the work of God's kingdom, the Lord will always remember us. Amen. And I'm closing. It's, it's a quarter till. I've got to stop. But this is my closing. We know the story so well. Elijah and Elisha went on and they crossed the Jordan River and chariot and horses of fire came by and Elijah and Elisha were parted and Elijah had told Elisha, if you see me when I take it away from you, I'll give you what you want and that's a double portion of my spirit. And the, they were parted and Elisha saw the chariot and the horses of fire and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And when he did, the mantle that was on Elijah fell back down to the earth. And Elisha picked it up. And he took it back and he went and stood at the banks of the Jordan. And he wrapped the mantle together and he smote it over the water. And when he did, he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the water parted for him just like it had for Elijah. And we would do well to remember this. What preceding generations had that they got out of an experience with God, we can have it, but we will get it the same way they did by a relationship and an experience with God. Not by, I mean, I, I'm going to be country this morning, not by newfangled ideas and not by programs. And, and, and though they may be great and not by, but, but, you know, bringing in all the things that people do to try to attract the crowd. We will have revival. We will have a move of God. And we will have, amen, what God has promised us the same way preceding generations did by being in love with Jesus. And get I tell you, the best thing that we can pass to the next generation is that same commitment to holiness, to the truth, to Jesus' name baptism, to love for the things of God, to keeping the world out of our lives, and on down the line. The best thing that Elijah could give to Elisha was a relationship with God. And the best thing that we can hand to the next generation this morning is a relationship with God. We're talking about, I mean, relationships in this quarter. And the most important relationship that you and I will ever have is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And the most important thing that you can teach your children. I know we all want for the next generation better than we had and we want our children to grow up and be successful and to, to be blessed and, and all the things that we desire for the next generation. But can I tell you this morning, the next generation, more than all that, what they need is to know that God will be there when we can't, when man can't, and whatever the situation is, if you will pass that down, there will come a day when they'll be able to say, hey, like Elisha could take the mantle and say, I remember Elijah smiting the mantle over the water and calling on God and the river rolled back. And there'll be a day your child will be in trouble and you can't be there. 
and there will be a day that that, that they won't know how they're going to pay the bills or they won't know what they're going to do about this or that or they, they will have a situation at work or they'll, somebody will be sick or, or they'll be trying to make a decision, whatever it is. And they will remember, Daddy and Mama taught me that when they were in a situation like this, they called on God and he answered. And I can call on the same God they called on, and he will answer me. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Maybe you weren't raised in, in church. Maybe you didn't have that privilege, but you can have the privilege of giving it to your children. And if you don't, amen, there's somebody here that doesn't have children this morning. Amen. You can have the privilege of passing it to somebody. Could we stand this morning and just, as we close, just talk to the Lord for a minute? Lord, we're so thankful, God, for your word today. We're thankful for the things of God. We're thankful, God, for, for a heritage, God, of, of being able to call upon you and call upon your name in times of trouble and, and times when we feel like, God, we don't know what to do or where to turn, Lord. But we are thankful, God, for the protection, God, of the church and the man of God in our lives. We're thankful, God, that you've given us a heritage, God, to pass it to our children, Lord. And I pray this morning that the word Word, God, would go into our hearts, would bring encouragement and strength today to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. We dismiss. We've got about 10 minutes before worship.